Hello, and welcome to the 2023 IRO Summit presented by Yardi Breeze and NAA. My name is Kendra Butterfield, and I'm the Vice President of Elevation Real Estate and Management in Arkansas. I'm a 22-year industry veteran. I am NAAEI faculty, and I am also a mental health first aid instructor. In addition, I am the 2023 chair of NAA's mental health subcommittee. I would like to give a disclaimer right here about, I am not a clinical expert and I'm not a medical professional. Today's session agenda is going to cover an introduction to mental health, factors that affect mental health, the importance of mental health, ways you can maintain positive mental health, and resources that are available. So let's get into the introduction to mental health. What is mental health? The World Health Organization defines mental health as a state of well mental well-being that enables people to cope with the stresses of life, realize their abilities, learn well and work well, and contribute to their community. Mental health is crucial to personal, community, and socioeconomic development. Mental health is more than the absence of mental disorders. It exists on a complex continuum that experienced differently from one person to the next and with varying degrees of difficulty and distress can present potentially very different social and clinical outcomes. So in a world and industry that is pulsating with constant changes and demands, the landscape of mental health has emerged as crucial territory to spotlight and spread that awareness and our resources. In addition, our goal is to make the mental health conversations comfortable and to destigmatize the topic. Just because someone may be struggling with a mental health issue should not devalue them as a person, a resident, or an employee. So who does mental health affect? One in five American adults, yes, you read that correctly, one in every five will have a diagnosable mental health condition in any given year. 46% of Americans will meet the criteria for a diagnosable mental health condition sometime in their life, and half of those by the age of 14. You know, throughout history, humanity has celebrated great minds that have shaped cultures, civilizations, and innovation. Abraham Lincoln comes to mind. Uh, did you know that Abraham Lincoln suffered from severe bouts of depression that physically incapacitated him that led to thoughts of suicide? And he was the 16th president. Vincent Van Gogh is another one that comes to mind. He was bipolar and manic depressive. Isaac Newton, manic depression. Uh, one of my favorite composers, Ludwig von Beethoven, bipolar disorder. And a revered uh, author is Charles Dickens, who suffered from clinical depression. And these are just a couple of examples of exemplary people throughout history who made an impact, but had a mental disorder at some point in their lives. So what are some factors that affect mental health? Well, we do have risk factors that we need to discuss. The first one being biological, family history. This could be family history of mental disorders where the word predisposed comes into play. Uh, their own previous history of mental disorder. And the reason why we say previous is because recovery from a mental health disorder challenge or crisis is possible and our ultimate goal. Psychological experiencing traumatic stress could be abuse or some other trauma. Some stem for, from what uh, clinical experts call ACEs, which are adverse 
childhood experiences uh, or mistreatment in early life. Familial, stressful life events like losing a loved one or divorce or a family history of substance use. Social, poverty, food, financial insecurity, food insecurity. Um, you know, when we think about working with our residents, this is probably where the, I would say that this is probably one of the top risk factors that we can actually attune with. We can, we know, and we can see and talk with our residents and we know who's feeling this and who's not. Um, we, this is also poor relationships or isolating themselves. And this also includes the stigma surrounding mental health conversations. Cultural, that's historical trauma, mistrust of healthcare systems. And then there's one additional factor, uh, risk factor to be aware of, which is trauma. This is a risk factor for nearly all mental disorders. And are we all not in an industry filled with traumas? We have fires, we have floods, hurricanes, tornadoes, deaths, um, some natural, some not natural. And that all leads to experiencing trauma. This also includes sexual assaults, intergenerational traumas, war experiences, neglect, and accidents. So we have the risk factors and now we have protective factors which you're probably looking at it and seeing the same bullet points, but that's because there's protective factors under the same umbrella. So we have biological, which is healthy eating habits or exercise. Psychological, being able to control and regulate emotions, having high self-esteem, having healthy, healthy coping strategies and using them, and having close relationships. Familial, that's that consistent home family routine. It's that sense of security. Social, having a good support system. These are the people who will support and uplift you. You know, in the business world, we have that sphere of influence that we talk about. And when you talk about the social aspect of a protective factor and that support system, that is creating those people, your sphere of influence for your mental health. Who are the people that are gonna check in on you? Who are the people who can help you? Uh, who are the people who are not gonna bring you down and support and uplift you, just like we said before? It's also important to have activities outside of the home. Maybe you like bowling. Maybe you just like walking. Uh, we have lots of trail systems in Arkansas that are beautiful for walks. We maybe you enjoy going to a concert or a sports game, but it's important to have those exterior activities. And then cultural, knowing about and having that sense of cultural identity and belonging. This also includes religiosity, or spirituality. And we're gonna take a look at some warning signs. And you're gonna hear us talk about signs and, and you're gonna also hear me use the word symptoms a little bit later. And I do want to define the difference. The difference between signs and symptoms are signs are what we can see and symptoms are what people are feeling or what they are experiencing and we can't see that. So we're gonna look at some things that maybe we can see. So illogical thinking. You may not think that this could be a warning sign, but maybe the person approaches you with ideas of grandeur or overconfidence, or maybe now they're less confident or they're nervous, or maybe they're over seeking attention. That those are warning signs. Mood changes. Maybe somebody with a normal, uh, they normally have a bubbly personality and now they seem a little down or unhappy. They could just be having a bad day, but watch for that signs to see if it's getting worse. Uh, maybe they're angry and lashing out at others. That's 
that's a big sign right there as well for mood changes. Having no energy and a drop in productivity, that's difficulty performing the usual or normal day-to-day -day tasks. Maybe this is a person, maybe you're great at doing paperwork and the work is starting to slip. So keep an eye on that. Eating, sleeping too much or a decline in personal care. This would be someone who is usually looks put together or dressed to the nines, as my grandma would say, and they come in looking disheveled, or maybe you recognize they haven't showered in a couple of days. Withdrawal from usual activities. Maybe someone who usually sits with you or there's a group that usually maybe gets together for lunch. And they start to sit alone, they start to pull back, and now there's a loss of interest. There's also a loss of interest in activities that they previously enjoyed. I, uh, I had a resident one time who used to come to all of our functions that we put on at the property, and she missed one, and I didn't think much of it. She missed the second one. And I thought, you know, that's a little unusual. Um, maybe she's just been busy or out of town. Maybe, you know, we always think that as property managers, right? But then I noticed that on the third one that she wasn't there. And when I talked to a couple of people, they said they actually hadn't seen her leave her home in a while, her apartment. So I called her and I asked how she was doing. And she started crying because in the weeks leading up to this, not one person, even from her family, had ever reached out to check in with her. And this was a resident. She had been in pain from depression. And so she physically couldn't get out of the house. And she emotionally didn't want to leave the house. So this is before my mental health first aid training. But what I did was is, I went out of my way to check in with her regularly and eventually she within a couple months started coming back out to all of our events and this was 10 12 years ago and she still lives at that property today um we have increased or sorry unusual behavior this would be odd uncharacteristic behavior for this person maybe their speech makes no sense or maybe they're exhibiting inappropriate behavior that's not normal for them, or bizarre behavior that may include hallucinations. When I managed a property in Las Vegas, I had this gentleman, this resident, never had a previous issue with him. And he was out in the parking lot in front of the office and he was just screaming obscenities and yelling at people as they drove onto the property, walked into the property. And so somebody came in and complained as the property manager, you know, I went out to check on it, carefully assess the situation because I could tell he was in something was going on. I didn't know what. So I cautiously approached from a safe distance and I asked if he was okay. And when I did that, he turned and looked at me and said, could you not, can you not see the ships in the sky? And I'll leave the story at that, uh, at Las Vegas, ships in the sky. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Area 51, anyone. And so I reached out to my office staff and I told them, I was like, please call the medical, the medical team, the paramedics, uh, call 911. I was like, we just need someone here that can help him because he was obviously distressed in some way and was going through something. And so that was something that we visually could see. Increased absenteeism, self-explanatory. It's not showing up, not showing up at work, but also not being present in the moment. Maybe they aren't showing up to prior commitments either, and that's unusual for them. So that's another warning sign. And the last one we have here, thinking of harming yourself or others. And I put that on here, even though it's not really a warning sign because it's a thought, but if someone expresses this to you, 
if you or someone you know is thinking of harming yourself or someone else, please call 988 or 911. And this is why it's crucial to recognize the importance of mental health. The importance of mental health, individual well being. This is crucial for individuals as it helps promote self care, emotional well being, and a better quality of life. When people are aware of their own mental health and they understand the importance of maintaining their own mental health, the individual is actually more likely to seek help when needed, manage their stress more effectively, and then they can begin to help others. Because as much as we want to help everyone, our residents, maybe our team members, our peers, people we know in the industry, without us understanding the importance of our own mental health, we cannot begin to help others. Productivity and performance. If you have employees, or even if you manage everything alone, mental health directly impacts productivity and performance. When someone is struggling with mental health issues, their focus, their creativity, and the ability to work effectively can be compromised. And how do you think that affects your residents? Do you think that they get excellent over-the-top service from someone who may be struggling with a mental health issue? Probably not. Reduce stigma and recovery. This is our ultimate goal. Awareness initiatives contribute to reducing the stigma surrounding mental health. When we are openly discussing mental health, it becomes more acceptable to seek help and support. This can lead to increased understanding, increased empathy, and a more inclusive workplace culture. In addition, this is reducing the stigma and it allows the space to drive down that road to recovery. Because like any other illness, recovery is possible. Retention and engagement. If you have employees, understanding that a positive and supportive workplace environment that values mental health can lead to higher retention rates and engagement. Again, even if you were just one person doing it all alone, you can engage, you can engage with your residents in the same way and get the same results. They are more likely to stay with a company that cares about their mental well-being and can provide the resources. Let's take a look at the example I gave you about my resident who wasn't coming out to those functions and she still lives there to this day. Risk management. Again, I know most in here today are either individuals running the entire show or maybe you have a small team. If you do have a team, or maybe even just one other team member that, that's assisting you. Ignoring mental health concerns can lead to absenteeism. And this does include you as the owner and operator. We need to practice what we preach, right? You need to pay attention to yourselves as well. It goes back to understanding our own mental health. Innovation and creativity. Focusing on mental health can foster a culture of innovation and creativity. When employees or even you feel supported and valued, you're more likely to contribute uh, unique ideas and collaborate more effectively, leading to a more dynamic workplace. If you are an individual owner with no team, how can you create support and value to keep yourself motivated? And when you do those things, doesn't that lead to better ideas? and better communication. We have positive public image. Businesses that prioritize mental health and well-being are often seen as socially responsible and caring. Creating a positive image can enhance a company's reputation among its clients, its customers, and potential employees. And I say potential because even as independent rental operators working maybe alone with no other team, what if you grew to a point where you did need those team members? So this is just bringing that awareness. So even if you have no team, 
the way you approach a resident struggling with something can lead to the same outcome. They may start giving you those good Google reviews or they're going to stay at your property and continue leasing from you because you helped them through something or understood that they were going through something. And then cost savings. Everyone loves cost savings, but this comes down to a personal cost savings for the individual or you know the ownership, the resident, or even your team members. Because when people have access to mental health resources and support, there can be a decrease in the healthcare costs associated with stress-related illnesses, absenteeism, and turnover. This includes you as the owners yourself, because wouldn't you like to save some money? You're so stressed out and you keep getting sick. Maybe it's a sinus infection. I know when I get stressed out, I get a sinus infection um, and I end up going to the doctor. If my mental health is good, everything is good. My physical health is good. I'm not spending that money out of pocket to, to pay a doctor to tell me I have a sinus infection because I'm stressed out. And there's other stress-related illnesses that we can... Uh, we can look up. So I've given you risk factors, protective factors, some warning signs. So what are some ways to maintain positive mental health? Well, we can create our boundaries. Number one, and I understand how hard it is already saying no to a resident, but that's a boundary we've created in this property management world. But the one thing we haven't done successfully is creating those boundaries for ourselves. And we need to be able to tell ourselves no. Those two little letters, that one word, just say no. Because creating boundaries can help you in your, in your mental state. That includes what hours you're going to reply to emails, decide how your, priorita uh, your priorities are categorized and in which order you're doing them. And then give yourself some set admin hours. Uh, our teams actually, uh, anybody in our offices, we are here at 830, but no one actually opens until 10 o'clock because we give our teams and our people, including our upper management, time to take care of the things that are on maybe their task list uh, that they have to get accomplished, but Inevitably, we open that door and residents are walking in and now those aren't getting accomplished. So by setting those hours for yourself, you're creating those boundaries and it definitely helps your mental health. Practice self-care. Self-care is not selfish. This is part of taking care of yourself the same way you would go to the doctor or to the gym. You could go do yoga uh, self-care could even be taking a hike or a walk that you've been wanting to go on. Uh, for me, it's getting my nails done with my daughter. Uh, it's just something that's very relaxing. We get to spend a couple of hours together every couple of weeks, just uninhibited by the walls of our house. And we get out and we do something. And I'm not saying self-care has to be monetary. I'm just giving an example of what I enjoy doing. Celebrate your wins. I'm not sure if everyone's familiar with Dr. Debbie Phillips, but if you're not, you should be. Recently, I was in a room with her and I heard her say that, celebrate your wins. And she gave us a way to do that. And she told us how to do that. And it has completely elevated my mood. And I do it on Fridays. And I'm going to tell you why I have chosen to, do, to celebrate my wins on Fridays. So we have our weeks planned out as owner operators. And we know in this industry, nothing ever goes to plan during the week. So you may start off with 50 tasks at the beginning of the week, maybe on Monday. Monday, you may be interrupted a few times and not get everything accomplished. Now those tasks have now moved to Tuesday for me on top of everything I was supposed to get done for Tuesday already. So now not everything that I didn't get done Tuesday is now going to Wednesday. You can see where this is going into Friday. So those 50 tasks that I started out with at the beginning of the week, maybe I only accomplished 20 of those and I have 30 outstanding tasks. Prior to hearing Dr. Debbie say this, 
I was the person that focused on those 30 things I didn't get done because I felt they were just so important. And I would think about them all weekend. Sometimes I would start working on them on, over the weekend. And come Sunday, I was the person who dreaded going to work on Monday morning and I couldn't sleep the night before. So Monday was always a terrible day for me. Well, now I flipped the script, thanks to Dr. Debbie. So on Fridays, I celebrate the wins and I put the ones aside that I, the, the my losses, I'm gonna just call them the losses. So I throw the losses aside and I take a look at everything that I did get accomplished. And that includes every interruption because every interruption is now a new task. So you have to keep that in mind too. You actually accomplished all those interruptions in addition to those 20 tasks that were already on that list. Friday afternoons is great. I get to take a look and see everything I got done. I get to write down how I got there, why I got there, and who helped me get there. And the reason why I say who is because if somebody helped you accomplish a task, would it not be wonderful for their mental health to hear you give some gratitude to them for helping you accomplish your wins for the week? I want you to think about that now. They're going into Friday and the weekend in a better mood because you just gave them some gratitude. In addition to that, now I'm on a high, my mood is elevated because I'm like, woo, woo, rah, rah. I am my own cheerleader. Sorry, I was not a cheerleader in high school, as you could tell. And so now I'm celebrating those. I'm on the high. And now I have a wonderful weekend with my family. I'm able to take that step back and separate and create. That's another boundary. And on Sunday nights, I'm not dreading work on Mondays anymore. I'm not thinking about work on a Sunday night and I sleep on Sunday night and Mondays, they aren't like what they used to be. And maybe Fridays don't work for you, but definitely celebrate those wins. Journaling is a great way to decompress and let emotions out and let them go. It's also a great way for you to lead yourself to some really great ideas and aha moments. You could create playlists for different activities. Maybe, maybe you do suffer from anxiety and depression like I do. And music is a soother to you. It's one of your grounders. So I created playlists for certain things that I do that may, may be a stressor to me. My favorite is listening to Tchaikovsky radio on Pandora as I'm working on financials. Uh, and in there, probably one of my most favorite songs is going to be the ride of the Valkyries. Whenever that comes on, I don't know how, but I, I swear it makes me so much more productive. Just the, um, just the sound of it is amazing. And if I'm starting to maybe have anxiety or panic attack on the highway uh, from traffic or just things happening or for no reason, I have a playlist that's called Feel Good for Anxiety, which is music that's tailored to me that helps me refocus and helps calm me. And if that one doesn't work, then I have a playlist called There Will Be Dancing in the Car because I am one of the dancers in the car. I, I will dance in the car. Um, and then I also have a playlist for shopping because shopping induces anxiety for me. So I can pop my AirPods in and off we go. There's grounding exercises. You know, we touched on that with the playlist. It's sort of a grounding exercise, but there's actual exercises that can be done. The first one is three, 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 which is three things you can see three things you can hear, and then three body parts that you can move. Or you can do the five, four, three, two, one exercise, which is five things you can see, four things you can touch, three things that you can hear, two things that you can smell, and one thing you can taste. And then there is another one that I, that I personally recommend, and that's if you suffer from um, anxiety, depression, uh, maybe you're very stressed out. 
the it's called the ice the ice cubes or the very cold water the very cold showers the shock to the system science has proven that our body temperatures actually increase when we start feeling stressed and if you do suffer from anxiety uh, or panic attacks you know our, our body temperatures are really high at that point so an ice cube or a very cold shower as a shock to the system can help lower your body temperature very quickly and help reground you. And when I say ice cubes, like you're putting them on your face, maybe down your neck, anywhere you normally feel hot, like I start in here, I come across the forehead and then down the arms. Sometimes I get down to legs, depending on, on how I'm feeling. Or I just jump in a really cold shower if I don't have ice available. Or I go into, my, if I'm feeling it at work, I just walk into the restroom and do the splash, the cold water on the face a couple of times. And that does, that does start to help and reground you. Make sleep a priority. That 10 p.m. email can wait until the morning. Going back to the boundaries. Set goals. If you're someone like me, setting those goals and then completing the goals actually releases endorphins and I feel better about myself. And then it makes me more engaged with what I'm doing, more engaged and motivated at work to continue going, to continue hitting my goals. And then make sure you're practicing gratitude and positivity. Even if all you do is you're thanking the sun for being out today, just make sure you're consistent with it, right? We always say in this industry, consistency is key. It's, it's true here as well. It's easy also to say in this industry to practice positivity, but it could be as simple as taking one word that maybe has a negative connotation associated with it and changing it into a more positive phrase. Um, and doing this consistently can change your overall health and, and well-being. It's going back to that power of positive thinking. So I've given you risk factors, the importance of mental health, oh, uh, ways to maintain positive mental health, but what resources do we actually have available to us? The National Council for Mental Well-Being provided the mental health first aiders this almost exact slide. This is the information that they recommend to be plugged into our phones at all times as just if somebody needs a resource really quickly, it's easy to just pull up the resource on the phone and there you have it. You have two SAMHSAs which are the substance abuse and mental health lines. One is specific to the disaster distress. You have the Trevor Project, which can be text or called. The NIDA helpline, which can also be text or called. The National Sexual Assault Hotline and the Suicide Prevention Hotline that is now 988. If you are in an area that for some reason does not have 988 yet, or that the 988 teams in your area are not yet fully prepared for these calls, you can still reach out to those first responders and request a CIT trained officer to come out to assist you. CIT is just crisis intervention training. And while it's not specific to mental health, first aid, they are trained to help in a crisis. And then within 10 seconds of me Googling mental health uh, resources, this is not everything that popped up, but there were dozens and dozens of resources available by multiple organizations that are reputable. Uh, in fact, there's too many to get into a presentation to share with you. So I highly recommend you crafting your own resource page and looking up and Googling those mental health resources. For me, I have on here the National Council for Mental Well-Being. We have the Pride Counseling website, Inclusive Therapist, the Black Mental Health Alliance, Mental Health America, which is a side note, Mental Health America actually has this great program that if you're looking at implementing a mental health uh, policy procedure or some 
sort of program into your organization, they actually have a toolkit for that. And then we have the CDC, Alcoholics Anonymous, the National Center for PTSD for Veterans, the National Sleep Foundation, Narcotics Anonymous, the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, and the International OCD Foundation. And I gave you all the links to those resources. But we also have resources at the tip of our finger every day with our phones. So these are some mental health apps that either myself or somebody I know has actual experience with. And that's why I have them on there, but there are so many we can look up. The first three are all talk therapy apps. The, they actually partner, uh, you answer some questions and then they will pair you up with um, somebody who meets your need at the time. Uh, and it'll be like a counselor and they even have doctors on some of them. I know on cerebral, you can actually meet with a, not just counselors, but you can actually, they do diagnoses through their app as well. Uh, day one is journaling. If you don't know where to start with journaling, you can start with a journal app and they give you prompts. So it makes it easier for you to know how to start journaling. Headspaces for mindfulness. Uh, meditation, really thinking about your day. Um, we have I Am Sober for Addiction, Happify, which focuses on stress and worry, and they have games, activities, and meditation. Worry Watch is a mental health tracker, and they assist with anxiety and mood, and it actually keeps, uh, it kind of helps you and gives you little reminders throughout the day, and is just tracking your mental health. And to add a side note to that, to any iPhone users in the room today who are interested in this kind of app, I would like to say that when iOS 17 finally releases to the public, I happen to be a beta tester, so I got early access to see all of this, their mental health stuff that they have coming online, and it looks fantastic. They have so much going on right within the health app, and that's going to include journaling. It's going to include, it's going to tie that journal to your health. In addition to that, you have the mental health tracker built in to your iPhone and into your, to your health app again. You have I am, which is daily affirmations, which is great to help keep that power of positive thinking that we were talking about. And then the last two on this list, probably my favorite two Gratitude is by far my, personally, my favorite app. I did not know how to journal. I didn't know where to start. And so I played with a couple of different apps. I found this one and it does prompted journaling, but it also gives me reminders throughout the day to journal and it gives me the prompts. It also checks in with me and was like, hey, would you like to journal right now? Like, is anything going on that you would like to journal about? So it's great to have these reminders pop up because we're so busy as property management professionals that, that sometimes we don't take the time out of the day to really check in with ourselves. Mm -hmm. And maybe as an independent rental operator, you don't have somebody checking in on you. And so this would be a great way for, it's not somebody that's checking in with you, but it's a great way to check in with yourself. And it goes back to what I was talking about before about maybe not knowing where to journal, but journaling being great. It has prompted journaling. It also ties back into uh, the assisting, it assists with acknowledging and giving gratitude to those people who helped you or gratitude to anything and celebrating your wins, which we've been talking about. And then Calm, which is probably the most well-known, I would think, uh, app on this list. I actually don't use Calm for what it was intended for. Um, I do use some of it, like the breathing exercises occasionally, I might use that. But what I do use it for is totally worth money for the year. I sometimes suffer from insomnia and they have great sleep stories 
if anyone in here is familiar with the movies Frozen, they have a sleep story on there called The Snow Queen that's read by this amazing voice actor. And The Snow Queen is actually the story that Frozen was based on. And it's a 32 to 36 minute um, audio listen. And I don't think I've ever made it past the first 15 minutes. I'm usually asleep that quick with this. And I, I don't know if it's the music that's playing in the background, but it's so soft and soothing. And the people's voices are just soft and soothing. There's also a gentleman who reads Edgar Allan Poe stories, who in a million years ever thought we could go to sleep to Edgar Allan Poe stories. Uh, the first one I ever listened to was The Raven. And again, I don't think I made it past the first five to 10 minutes and I fell asleep. So I highly recommend Calm. There might be other ones out there for that help sleep, but I do enjoy their sleep stories. And then we also have resources through the National Apartment Association now. There were three surveys conducted, the mental and emotional well-being surveys in 2021, 2022, and 2023. Two of those produced white paper results about the mental state of our industry with insights, trends, and their findings. And I've put the link right here for you that'll take you right to the surveys on NAA's website. It also produced a recorded a uh, first time ever free to the public apartmentalized session from 2022. And that can be watched on NAA's YouTube channel. I've also included that link. We have mental health awareness week webinars from 2022 and 2023. Each of those weeks uh, had three presentations by clinical experts in partnership with the National Council for Mental Wellbeing. And then we had one that was led by industry experts who could bring real world application to the members to see how mental health ties in with our industry. We also, thanks to Grace Hill, have a mental health policy template. Even if you are still just an owner operator with no team, this is still a really great resource. It's a best in practice policy uh, because it just has everything you need. It has a purpose. It has the scope. It talks about laws. It has definitions. And the most important part is it includes how employees or owners can take steps to manage the symptoms. Remember, we talked about what symptoms were. Symptoms are what we're feeling. So the steps to manage the symptoms and manage the long-term side effects that are associated with the stress that we experience on a daily basis. And this is a fully customizable and free policy. So again, even if you're just one person, it's still a great reference and resource to have. And I've included the link to that as well. Lastly, we have our mental health first aid certification. NAA sponsored 12 very diverse members to take a three-day course to become certified mental health first aid instructors. Mental health first aid, think of it like CPR. Uh, you're just helping the person until the paramedics arrive. In mental health first aid, all you're doing is you're not diagnosing, you're not treating. We are just there to help get that person to the point where we can get them to a resource if they're in need of the resources, or we can get the resources they need to them. Maybe they're not experiencing something that's quite that catastrophic yet, or a crisis that's, that's technically called. But what you can do is, remember my stories of listening to my residents. You can listen non-judgmentally, you can give reassurance and you encourage, you can encourage people to seek help or find the resources uh, that they need and encourage them to help themselves by giving them the resources. You know, I have a one pager for my properties that they can pull up, up that if somebody comes into the office and they're experiencing something and 
course, my teams are trained in mental health first aid, and they can give that to the people and be like, here's some resources that we think might help if you feel like you're in need of it. And this can be actually, this mental health first aid is not specific to our industry. This is a national certification that can be trained in any industry to anyone in any setting and just life in general. I'd like to share another story with you about how this can be utilized outside of our industry. So I broke my foot the day before I was supposed to speak at Apartmentalize this year. And I was wheeled up to the front of the gate when I was leaving and the gate attendant was there and she didn't, she maybe looked a little tired, but we were just sitting there, nothing else to do. And so I asked her how she was doing and she turned and she asked if I really meant that. And I put, I immediately put my mental health first aid hat on because we learned in mental health first aid, the United States, we use the term or the question, how are you doing today as more of a greeting? And we're not really expecting a true response from somebody. So we need to change that. If we're going to ask somebody how they're doing today, we need to be prepared to actually listen to them and give them that safe space. So yes, going back to my gate attendant, I gave her that space and I said, yes, I said, we're just sitting here. I have nowhere to be. I can't walk. And she dropped to the floor and she started crying and she shared with me a story about her dog had just passed that morning and it's her son's service dog. And her son suffers from type two bipolar disorder and actually was currently hospitalized because he had tried to take his life. And so I just let her talk. I just listened to her and just let her get everything out. And she said to me, I'm just so thankful that it happened while he was in the hospital because my son probably wouldn't be here right now if he had been home when his dog had passed. So then she goes into more of like the story because of I continue to let her talk and she's talking and I have somebody else who is in the industry who had been at apartmentalized that I know locally on the same flight home with me. She approaches and she was like, hi, Kendra. She was like, I heard you talked to apartmentalized this year. What did you talk about? So I told her what the session was on and what my part was about, which was being a mental health first aid instructor and bringing awareness to mental health first aid. And as we're talking, I see the gate attendant listening very intently to our conversation. Conversation. A couple minutes later, she grabs my arm, the gate attendant, and she goes, ma'am, we're getting ready. She goes, I have to call boarding soon. She goes, but before I do that, she goes, can you please share with me all any and all resources you possibly have? So I immediately whipped out my phone, whipped out the National Council for Mental Wellbeing's uh, resource page that I saved in my phone, gave her all the information. And then she asked me, how do I become certified in mental health first aid? aid she was because when my son comes home from the hospital I want to be more equipped to help him how powerful and impactful is that that just by giving somebody the safe space to open up and actually listen to them non-judgmentally how that opened up a whole other thing for this woman and probably has helped her and her son in some way and so that's just a, a short little example of how we can utilize this even outside of our industry. So we've been talking today about the bottom line of mental health, and I'm sure everyone thought the bottom line of mental health was going to come down to those dollar signs. We did talk about some cost savings when it came to your mental well-being, which is not spending that money at the doctor's office on stress-related illnesses. but the bottom line of mental health is when it comes to our well being, mental health is an essential component that intertwines with our overall health and wellness. The bottom line to mental health is that mental health is health, it's just health. So I would like to thank everybody here today who joined me. And my contact information is here. If you'd like to reach out, Kendra at elevationrm.com. 
And if you'd like to join the conversation and continue that conversation on social media, you can tag at Yardy Breeze, at NAAHQ, and hashtag IRO Summit. I hope everyone has a wonderful day. Thank you.